Okay, we'll get started in just a couple minutes here. <clears throat> yeah, how's everyone doing tonight? On this stormy, stormy night. Yes, such a storm in Kelowna. Hello, hello to Castlegar. Hello to Lillooet. Yeah, sounds like everybody's kind of on the same uh, path here. And you lost a section of your roof over your deck. Oh my goodness me, that's scary. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, it sounds a little bit quieter here, but um, anyway, hopefully the power will stay on and uh, the internet will stay on at least for the next hour to dive into, I think, a perfect topic for tonight. Um, and that is anxiety in managing the anxiety in chronic pain. So if you're um, uh, making a comment in the chat, it's so great to see so many people um, commenting. Just remember um, that if you want everybody to see it, just send it to everyone where there, there's that little upside down triangle um, rather than just hosts and panelists, if you want to. Hello to Cranbrook. Okay. Got people from all over tonight. And it sounds like the sounding to me like the whole um, Okanagan or the whole area is in a bit of a storm from what people are saying here. And uh, yeah, I've got a, a dog behind me having a, a panic attack. So talking about anxiety is a good thing. All right. So I'm just going to let Mark in here and uh, we'll get going. Hi there. Can you just let me in on the video as well? Thanks. Okay. There we are. Hi there. Okay, hello, good evening. Mm -hmm. How's How are going? things uh, down um, in the area of downtown in the clinic? Yeah, we had a little power outage show for a, a while, big power surge, and then computers went dead for a while and then managed to boot them all up again, fortunately, but it was quite the rainstorm coming through a while. Yeah, 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 it really was. And from the sounds of it, it was all over. Yeah, you got a feel for people uh, in Merritt who are evacuated mm -hmm. and then Princeton and other areas and people stuck on the highway. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, on this so, important subject. Yes, exactly. Tonight we're going to talk about managing anxiety in chronic pain. And originally it was scheduled as um, using breath work and, and breathing to manage the stress of pain. And I just had a lot of people reaching out um, and just um, for a myriad of reasons, uh, feeling anxious right now. And um, so I thought it would be a, a good time this Monday night rather than waiting, because right now we're, I think we're pretty much booked on Mondays until the new year, um, rather than waiting to the new year, but to do it tonight to talk about managing anxiety that comes about as a result of being in pain naturally, um, and also how anxiety about other stressors in your life or other things going in your life can um, add to the experience of, of physical pain. So, so that's what we're talking about tonight. Um, yeah, you know, for my a little bit, we will often do screening tests or screening evaluations on patients that get referred to the clinic um, through our thing called Thrive because... Um, anxiety and, and, and depression, but particularly anxiety, we note um, if it's not addressed um, or managed, has a significant negative um, impact on patients' ability to, to process, manage, and deal with their chronic pain. Uh, it, uncontrolled anxiety or heightened anxiety, I mean, we know that it ramps up the nervous system uh, which affects uh, so many things. Sleep, which is essential for restoration um, and for healing, but also just 
the whole anxiety state with all the sort of heightened awareness and adrenaline floating around and cortisol uh, not only affects um, um, you know, healing and, and repair, but just that negative emotion um, impacts patients' ability to process, manage, and, and deal with their pain in, in a, a healthier way. So I think this is huge. You know? mm-hmm. it's, it's really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. It's kind of like it's a two-way street there. Mm-hmm. Um, when you have anxiety, it's much harder to um, think straight, uh, think clear, make good decisions, uh, even around your health. Um, and it's so much easier to go down that rabbit hole of, you know, from emotional eating to, um, you know, other ways of, of numbing out like, like uh, alcohol, drugs, overthinking, all kinds of ways of, of numbing our anxiety. Um, Absolutely. Because we're human. Yeah. Right. And then, I mean, also then patients, understandably, who have chronic pain, have anxiety because they wonder, will this ever go away? Will this improve? Will this get better? And a lot of what we do is, is manage their pain. You know, I, I, I always look at it as, are we able to turn it down as opposed to turn it off? And in helping people to try and turn it down, if we don't address um, the, the anxiety and some of the other psychological things, but tonight we're talking about anxiety, it makes it far harder to, to really turn it down. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, if you can think about kind of being ramped up with with pain mm-hmm. in your central nervous system, and then also wound up with anxiety, it's it's really difficult to be able mm-hmm. for your body to spend time um, healing and restoring itself. And at the same time, I, I don't want anybody to think, "Oh my goodness, I've been creating this." No, no, that's not what I was saying mm-hmm. at all. No. But this is a doorway that I, we're going to dive into um, that uh, you can use to turn down the volume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's, it's, also, it's not just chronic pain. I mean, I'm, you know, heightened anxiety has a negative impact on so many other things in our lives, you know, not just pain, you know, our relationships, how we function, how we interact, you know, how we make it through our day, right? So uh, it's important to address it from that perspective as well. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so we will dive in. And I also suggest, I don't, I don't think I've ever said this before, but you might want a pen and paper for this one. Um, not necessary. We are being recorded. So you'll see it again. But there's a couple of things that I'm going to point you towards that you might want to notice in yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, yeah, so welcome to everybody. And, uh, and once again, just respect one another's confidentiality. Uh, just look at it as a professional physician group visit where um, you know, feel free and comfortable to express yourself. And as long as we respect one another, that's all we ask. Yeah. Great, thanks. Take care. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see me and hear me okay. Um, and uh, before we get in, to this tonight's topic. So before we start, I'm going to give you just a really uh, quick way right now to um, let your nervous system know that um, uh, that you're here and that you're safe and that you're taking care of it, of it, it, of course, I'm meaning you, is to settle in and just start by taking a couple of deeper, slower breaths. So this is always going to be a tool that you have available and it's free, it's always accessible, no side effects, just to take your anxiety perhaps down a notch or two. So as you start to just breathe a little bit deeper, we're activating a nerve called the vagus nerve that we're gonna talk about a bit later that over time when it's activated, kind of flips us into um, another side, another branch of our nervous system from fight or flight, freeze over to rest and digest. Okay. 
So the other thing to do right now is just to see if there's anything you need to do in terms of maybe fidgeting a little bit, getting more comfortable. Are you holding yourself really tightly, you know, focused in on the screen? Would it be uh, more um, easeful to sit back? Do you need to take some water? Just start to notice yourself. What do I need in this moment? Okay. All right, okay, so we already really did this. <laughs> Grounding and centering. Always our tool to breathe in and then breathe out. And allow yourself to, as best you can, move from the top part of your body. This might sound like a foreign language right now. Right down with your breath into the lower half of your legs, your feet, and the earth. And just see what that felt like right now. We'll just do it one more time. To take a deep inhale, expanding your lungs side to side, front to back as best you can, and then exhale out of your mouth. <sighs> and land right here. Okay. Now, if you are really kind of spinning today, if your mind is racing, if you're feeling really agitated, you never um, uh, force yourself into something like this. You just do the best that you can. So have you ever been told to just calm down or don't worry or don't worry about it so much or you're a worry wart? Everything's fine. You don't have to worry. Everything's just fine. And I want to ask you, did that feel kind of impossible? And maybe, in fact, made you feel even worse. So there is a reason for that. You know, we used to, uh, or still, you know, I know a lot of teachers and, um, you know, or we've been told maybe in the classroom, just calm yourself down, just calm down. Well, the fact of the matter is that sometimes we know we need to somehow do this thing called calming ourselves down, but particularly as children, we're not actually taught the tools of how to do that. So it can really add to the anxiety when you're feeling really tense, right? And, you know, even someone saying, don't worry, or everything's fine, I, uh, you know, talk to the nervous system and, and tell, tell it that because it's not feeling that way. And so it goes far beyond just telling yourself to calm down and goes a little bit deeper into our bodies. So if you felt that way, you are really normal. And why is that? Well, anxiety and worrying. It actually is a normal function of being human. So anxiety is one of those emotions amongst the myriad of maybe 200 different emotions that we have the potential to feel. But it is also, you know, in my experience and in so many people that I work with, it's one of the most uncomfortable feelings, isn't it? And it can also send our rational thinking, logical brain offline. So if you are feeling you know, really worried about something, it's taken up a lot of the real estate in, in your mind, you've got something going on and that you're concerned about. It can be really hard to concentrate, really hard uh, you know, to sit down and do your taxes. Have you noticed that? Because so much of your brain is taken up um, by worry. And as I said, it, it's also one of the most uncomfortable feelings. And because often it can be something called like free floating anxiety. We might be very specifically worried about, you know, our pain condition or what's going to happen in the future or the storm that's outside. Um, or it can just be a simple waking up with a feeling of dread in your stomach, okay? And the kicker is that fighting anxiety can make it worse. 
So when we go to war with our anxiety and I'm just going to beat this thing and uh, I'm just going to get rid of it, it can often create even more tension, more resistance, and more of that bracing feeling in your body. So we're going to talk about other ways um, to do that tonight. So stress and anxiety can literally flip our lid. And every time I think about, you know, flipping, flipping your lid, I, I think of, um, I think of people that get trapped in, in road rage and how for that period of time where it, it was perhaps, perhaps there, who knows a lot of things going on in their life, someone cuts them off and it's like the straw that broke the camel's back or, uh, you know, the example of someone coming home after a really stressful day and the dog's barking and, you know, they yell at the dog. Um, and it's like the last thing that they can take that flips their lid. And it literally, so if we take our hand, and we did this in the mindfulness class this morning, for those of you that were there. And <clears throat> if you pictured your hand being like a brain, so your, your, you can, it helps if you actually do this, because then it's far easier to remember when we involve our bodies. So if you think about your wrist and your forearm as the brainstem, and the brainstem is responsible for all those um, survival patterns, like eating and sleeping and breathing. So all of those things happen automatically. And then we have the front part of our brain that I'm going to fold over my thumb. So our front part of our brain is our prefrontal cortex. And that's the last part of our brain that's developed um, as we've evolved. But underneath that rational thinking, um, prefrontal evolved part of our brain is our thumb. And our thumb is our amygdala. And the amygdala is where all the emotions are contained. So if you've had had trauma. Um, and when you think about that trauma, your amygdala is going to light up in a brain scan. So the anger, the fear, anxiety, all the sadness is contained right in the center of your brain. Well, not right in the center, but underneath your prefrontal cortex. So when anxiety hits us, when worry comes along, we literally lose contact, flip our lid, with our, pre, with our uh, prefrontal cortex and this guy inside that contains all your memories, your past experiences of uh, worry or trauma, feeling unsafe or sadness, that's, what, that's what's in charge. And that what is what starts running the show when, um, when you can feel yourself starting to become unraveled. And uh, whether you're driving or you, you know, um, having in, in the middle of a conflict um, or you're just beside yourself, that amygdala is literally what's um, in control. So this, this workshop tonight is about bringing that prefrontal cortex back online so that you can have a slower heart rate, think more clearly, blood vessels return to normal, muscle tension relaxes, pain sensations decrease. Okay, that's, that's where we're headed. So remember, when you're flipping your lid, we're gonna learn some tools to put your lid back on. So go easy on yourself here tonight. We can start to become aware of our anxiety and then make the choices that you need. You wanna have them handy or just know them to help bring your lid your prefrontal cortex back online by becoming aware of the fear, becoming aware of what's perhaps triggering the anxiety, or you might not even be able to figure that out. You might just know how it shows up in your body and then know what you need in order to self-regulate. And that is a job that, you know, absolutely when you're a child, you look to a parent for that self-regulation but now um, as adults, it might help to have a safe person with you, but ultimately it's really up, only up to us to be able to regulate our own nervous systems. Nobody else can get inside your body and do that. Okay, so, so remember 
right now in this moment, in this step, as you take a breath, you know, just notice that you are in fact safe. And the reason I say that is because we can have a tremendous amount of feelings of being unsafe um, rising in our bodies when we look around our room and notice like, you no, know, it's weird, I actually am safe. There's no in incoming traffic. There is no, um, you know, vicious animals chasing me and, I, and I'm not being sarcastic. I really mean that that's how your body, um, uh, reg not regulates, that's how your body um, senses fear in the same way that it would as if you were being chased by a grizzly bear. So notice, it's important to just notice that you're safe, but why do we continue to feel unsafe? And I think this goes for pretty much 100% of humans at various times. We have to feel unsafe and anxious because we're wired for it. So we are wired for it through how we have evolved, but we haven't evolved fast enough in our brains quite yet. So I just want to ask, is there anybody here who is not anxious about um, their pain or their, their health condition? And you can just ask yourself that. Not me. I'm anxious. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it would be very, it's possible. Um, but usually when you have a pain condition, because pain is the uh, signal for protection against threat and danger, you're gonna have some anxiety. Yeah, yeah, so lots of messages coming into me saying same, yeah, I'm anxious, yeah. And I wanna say, of course you are, okay? So we want to get any kind of judgment or self uh, uh, criticism off the table right now, because um, it's really unusual to have pain and not have anxiety, although that's where we're headed, because they go together. And in fact, one tends to feed the other, because we produce that pain and fear in the same areas of the brain. So that part that I told you about, amongst other parts, of course, um, but it, it uh, shares that same home, the same real estate in, in the brain. So one is going to um, trigger the other. And one, when we target one, we can, often, um, we can often target the other as well. And if, if you haven't taken the Empowered Relief class uh, yet, I would really encourage you to. It, it happens once a month. Um, and it explains a little bit more about that. As pain becomes chronic or it's just not going away, it's natural for the brain to become more fearful. Like maybe you've had an injury or a, a condition of some sort. And maybe when it started, you really expected, as anybody would, that after it's healed, that the pain would also go away. And Maybe as time went on, you started to worry about why is this pain still here? Have they not, have they not found something yet? Um, what is going to be the answer to my pain? When is it going to go away? Uh, what if it doesn't? You know, all those thoughts that um, feed back into our um, nervous systems into our, our pain condition. And um, yeah, I'll just move on here. Yeah. But it is possible to be in pain and not be as anxious, just as it's possible to have a low pain day and continue to worry, right? So if we can start to bring down the anxiety over time, with you know what we call um, you know one degree course corrections over time, our nervous system can start to shift because treating one tends to help the other. So, if you're feeling right now um, 
yeah, see, my pain is raising my blood pressure. Absolutely, it does. Um, the pain response, the re reaction to the pain is going to be higher blood pressure. Um, when you're anxious, my pain gets worse. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a physiological response that kind of ups the ante, you know? Um, but so if you're thinking, oh my goodness, I'm so anxious, how am I going to ever, you know, bring this down, I'm making my pain worse? It's, this is also a very powerful doorway that we can use to pain management. Because sometimes we can't use our, own, our old ways of alleviating, alleviating anxiety and stress like exercise. So for some of us that we're used to being able to move or, I don't know, maybe go to the gym um, or, you know, during COVID, it was really difficult because, you know, to get out and socialize when we have that face-to-face -face eye contact, um, social engagement, that helps us to feel safer. So those old ways might not be available to us. If you were someone that worked before and is not working or not able to work now, um, that can also um, be one of those ways that is no longer available um, to us. And I mean, let's face it, we're a little bit more or more isolated, um, anxious thoughts. Have you noticed that they can become bigger and really feel more real. And um, if you know, one example of that is, you know, when you start going down the rabbit hole, and these thoughts naturally start to get bigger and bigger, and you know, your world can all become smaller and smaller. And um, then the phone rings for example, and, and maybe it's somebody in your family uh, or a friend that's reaching out to you and you have a conversation and conversation lasts for say 20 minutes and you put down the phone and um, you feel better. Maybe depending on the conversation, let's say it was positive. And have you ever had that when you put it down, you think now what, now what was it? What was it that I was going on about in my mind? Um, and for that moment in time, we may have forgotten our worries. If pain makes us believe that we are in danger, then it follows that we would have fear and anxiety. So chronic pain is that danger signal that hasn't turned off yet. And um, just, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit more about um, chronic pain versus acute pain. When we break a bone, we really need that. We go to the hospital, we get it fixed, and hopefully the pain goes away. Chronic pain is when those, um, that danger signal is still um, loud or loud, still sounding. So there can also be a lot of uncertain, uncertainty with chronic pain, and anxiety loves uncertainty. Humans do not particularly like uncertainty. Some people do. Um, but in my experience, uh, we, we are often geared towards what if, you know, and the uncertainty of the future. And when we start to realize that um, the future is always uncertain, in fact, the next moment is, is uncertain, the next half hour, we're not particularly sure what's going to happen, um, things can start to become a little bit easier. So sometimes people ask, did anxiety cause or increase my pain or vice versa? You know, um, sometimes pain goes up, anxiety goes up. Of course, anxiety goes up, sometimes pain goes up. So it's both. Um, anxiety or worry can exacerbate pain by causing tension and fear that holds us back or it simply makes us feel worse with that, the muscle tension. And it, it's been necessary for our survival. Humans, it's, it's survival of the most anxious, or it was. Survival of the worriest, is, if that's a word. Survival of the people that worried the most. Humans who worried and scanned their environment all the time for threat were the ones that survived. Um, and if, if you weren't able to catch a threat, you know, that could have mean death for our ancestors. Things have obviously changed right now. The chances of a threat coming towards you inside your room right now are probably pretty small. Um, 
but our nervous systems, I hope you're getting this, the, our nervous systems are still on alert. And pain, internal pain, represents a threat to our nervous system. We haven't been, our brains haven't been able to evolve fast enough yet to realize that 99.9% .9 of the time we are not in imminent danger. And you might just ask yourself right now, this is a really interesting question. Um, how many times in my life have I been in a life or death situation? How many times have I been in imminent danger? Obviously you survive. Don't forget that part. I want to take you right to your traumas. But when I think about my life, I can probably think about one, one time where I actually felt, you know, like, oh, it was on a bus trip in India. I, when I felt like, whoa, okay, I'm not sure this is going to, I'm not sure I'm going to make it through this one. But ask yourself, how many times have you actually felt like you are in imminent danger? And often it's not too, too many, I hope. Nope, it's not too many. But that feeling, our brain still processes it the same way. All right. So I just want to do something with you called the safety break. It could be a safety break as in taking a pause or actually putting on a safety break. So right now, wherever you are, that this two, three minutes is probably the most important part of the whole presentation. We've got more. Just pause. There's a lot of information that you might be focusing on, taking in, understanding, maybe resonating. Just pause for a moment and take two or three deeper, slower breaths. And just relax any muscle tension that you can right now. You might even close your eyes for a moment. So just notice, I just noticed a little bit of my shoulders. I'm just going to relax my shoulders. Notice your jaw, feet on the floor. And notice in this moment, any thoughts that you're running, any stories that are running. And you might, it might be a running thought of, What's going to happen or will this help me or doubts or I don't know if this is or whatever it is just notice any thoughts coming up right now and then notice that in this moment you're safe even if your thoughts in your body are trying to tell you something different in this moment okay in the, right now in this moment you're safe and luckily, I don't hear the wind outside anymore, so I'm even more convinced that right now I'm safe. This seems really small, but it's actually very profound to your nervous system to actually integrate that information that I'm safe right now, because we will find a hundred different reasons right now um, to be worried and, and to feel unsafe, right? So really quickly, I want to introduce you to, um, if you've been in my classes before, you know, I talk about the vagus nerve because it's now just one of the most biggest discoveries, I'd say, in the past, past decade when it comes to the nervous system. The vagus nerve is one of the big, is the biggest, I think it's, it's, it's a nerve that runs through all of our internal organs up and through, connects with the uh, lower part of our, um, uh, through our spine, through the lower part of our um, skull, our, our um, brain, and into um, our face and our ears. The vagus nerve, when we can turn it on, when we can trigger it, this is what takes us from that anxiety response, fight, flight, freeze, into the other, the parasympathetic branch of our nervous system, which tells our body it's okay to rest and digest. And I literally mean digest because it's related into the, um, into your gut and your internal organs. Okay. So right now we can, um, I'm going to take my glasses off. 
just a little exercise that you can do that can calm and regulate your nervous system, do this all by yourself anytime, is just to take your hands and just bring some soft touch, the soft touch like you would if you were holding a baby. And then take, you can take your hands and not so much to relax um, muscles. Okay, so if you can't see me and you're just listening, I'll, I'll just guide you through it, uh, Nicole. Or if you can find, if you're on an iPad or um, a phone, you might not be able to see me. Um, but uh, if you can't, if you um, can't, I'll, I'll describe what I'm doing, okay. So I'm taking my hands and I'm bringing them right to in between my eyebrows. And I'm giving myself a little bit of a very soft massage over right the length, the top of my eyebrows. And then I'm bringing my fingers round towards my temple and then to my ears. This sounds very, very strange, but we now have little electrical um, devices that have been uh, programmed to put on your ears to actually trigger the vagus nerve. That's how important this can be. So just give your, the outside of your ears a very gentle massage and maybe I've got earbuds in, so it's a little bit more difficult. Um, the bottom part of your ear that hangs down and then that little flap that connects to your cheekbone and then down and around through uh, along your jawbone, okay? And maybe even up and around behind your ear. So those are the areas where you can directly connect in with your vagus nerve. Um, I'm gonna leave it there for now, uh, but know that there's also, pro there's a lot of videos on the vagus nerve. Um, uh, it gets really complicated, but I think what you really need to know is that there are ways that you can use just like that to um, literally have a direct effect on calming your nervous system. All right. Okay, so knowledge about chronic pain when it comes to anxiety. I'm just gonna see if there's any questions about that. That's kind of... Just I wanna give you some tools as we move along. Knowledge about chronic pain is crucial because when you realize that your pain is, is an overactive danger signal that hasn't turned off, you can learn to manage it and not always respond in fear. So it's like a smoke alarm that, you know, when there's a little bit of heat, um, it goes off. So maybe if you have that extra central sensitization, what might feel like a light touch to someone else might feel painful or uncomfortable to you. So it's like a smoke alarm that's really highly sensitive and is overworking to protect you. When you start to know that, yeah, when you start to know that, um, you can know that, oh, okay, my pain's a little bit louder today, but I'm still okay. And that can start to take the edge off the fear and anxiety around it. Mm, yeah, thanks, Georgie. It's similar to an acupressure facial massage. Yeah, great. There is a, so much benefit to that, to the touch, to not only activating the vagus nerve, um, but if you tend to be in more of a fight flight, but the freeze response, we can also need help to um, loosen up those facial muscles that get, you know, get stuck. So anxiety, it's a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease. Generalized anxiety disorder, which is actually a diagnosis, occurs when that feeling gets chronic, so it's there a lot of the time, excessive, uncontrollable, irrational. In, in rational meaning, there's no particular um, thing that's happening that day. And it's associated with surprisingly diverse symptoms. So everybody, this is important, everybody is going to feel it slightly differently. At least uh, three symptoms must drive you batty for six months or more. 
for a formal um, diagnosis for six months or more. You know, and you don't need to get it. You guys know yourselves. Um, you you don't need to get a diagnosis to to know that. Um, but just to know that it it is a thing, and um, everybody is different in how it shows up. So, how do we work with anxiety in a helpful way with pain? Because all of the ways that our nervous systems attempt to avoid the suffering can create more suffering. And what I mean by that is when we try to avoid or fight or resist what's happening, uh, we can create another problem of muscle tension, um, resistance and fear um, and avoidance. If I know that a particular, okay, an example of, you know, um, a uh, car accident, if I know that that particular intersection increases my anxiety because of my memory, my memory of it, um, and so it's going to increase my pain, and so I take a long route around to work to avoid it, I'm still going to be very, very aware of it as I avoid it. Does that, if, I hope that makes sense. And there is a way to slowly, calmly, and safely move towards that intersection so that eventually through exposure, I'm able to drive through it. And okay, that's, just, that's just an example. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So how can we not add more suffering on top of the suffering? So in, just remember anxiety is not who you are. It is a sensation normally felt in the body, although some people say they, they actually feel like it's in their head. And what matters most is how you respond to it. So the, oops, the purpose, what is the purpose of this? I think you probably already know um, is survival. You know, it's a, it's a kind of a branch of fear, but anxiety also has the purpose of helping us plan ahead. It's not going to, anxiety is going to be what gets me up in the morning and makes sure that things are half ready so that I can get to work for say nine o'clock. There's going to be some anxiety there. Um, I want to say something, anxiety and excitement can, fear and excitement can show up in the body in the exact same way. So uh, if you have something big on your plate that you have to do, say a presentation or a meeting, you might want to check in with yourself and ask that simple question. Is this anxiety or excitement or a bit of both? Um, but in the case of chronic pain, there's not a lot of excitement. I don't think it's mostly anxiety, right? Um, it can also try to keep us comfortable. Now, how does that work? Anxiety might be telling me, move out of that uncomfortable situation and towards something that feels better. So it can be a signal of something. I don't wanna say just to wipe out all anxiety because we probably won't be able to, um, but it can also, you know, when you have a gut feeling or some tension about something or somebody, that can be valuable information, right? you're not being silly, you're not making things up. It can point us towards we, what we care about. So notice right now what, um, I'm going to put pain aside for a moment, or well, no, no, let's, like, if you're, pain can be a big worry because we care about our health. It can be a big worry because we care about our future. Uh, if we tend to worry about our kids, um, it's what we care about, right? Um, we don't tend to worry about things that we don't care so much about. So it does have a purpose. It also tells us what we need. And I feel anxious maybe when I need to eat, um, not getting enough sleep. I need to take a breath. Who, who here breath holds? Um, I feel anxious. I need to move. I need to get outside. I need to have a conversation with someone because I'm anxious about this to, or to connect with someone. I feel lonely and isolated and completely alone in this world, that makes me feel anxious. 
I need to connect with someone. So notice, first of all, before we talk about, you know, how to calm it, get rid of it, notice if it's giving you a message. I don't want to ignore this part of the talk because um, sometimes it does. Sometimes it's pointing us towards something or away from something. You know, if you've got anxiety about a particular person in your life, you, know, you might want to think about what that's telling you. There might be something to talk about. But when does anxiety not serve a purpose anymore? When is it not helpful? When there's nothing that can be done about it? I mean, and I think this is one of the kind of the, the worst, uh, most uncomfortable situations where uh, you kind of go into freeze because I'm anxious, I might have some pain, and I also feel helpless. I don't know, I just, no particular movement forward. So I have to create something for myself to move out of the freeze. Or I have to do something myself. When I'm believing a, a thought that's simply untrue or unhelpful in that moment. Um, you can give me an example of, a, you know, a thought about uh, pain um, that's simply untrue or unhelpful in the moment. Um, I'm not going to be able to function in 10 years. If I'm going down this road, uh, road I'm not going to be able to function in 10 years. Now, <clears throat> that might feel very, very true. But in this moment, <clears throat> there, it, it, I cannot see any um, uh, useful point of going over and over that thought. So that might direct you towards doing something um, that might be helpful for your health. I hope that's making sense. So when you have a thought that keeps on going around and round, racing thoughts, um, Eckhart Tolle says that, uh, you know, 80%, this is important, 80% of our thoughts are repetitive and negative. So those are the ones that are all geared towards survival, repetitive and negative. So that means most of our thoughts are probably not helpful. Maybe you're one of those people that, you know, doesn't have those racing thoughts. <laughs> when it takes on a life of its own. So when anxiety becomes that free floating dread um, that is not, doesn't seem to have any particular purpose. That's not helpful. When it becomes paralyzing, if you've ever been sort of paralyzed by fear um, or when it, it causes you to avoid things that you need to do. So that's the flight. So um, yeah, maybe this anxiety around going to the doctor, or I, I know there's people that won't go to the doctor because they're worried about what they're feeling in their bodies. Um, and it's preventing them from getting good health care. When it makes you feel angry, aggressive, scared, and just plain crappy, right? Just plain crappy. It can really interfere in your life. And when it affects relationships, it's very difficult to be present, right? When you're anxious. And it's exhausting. Uh, worrying is another level um, of something to do that actually is very, very draining. And when it makes pain worse or prevents movement, prevents you maybe movement in it. Self, please join me on Thursdays for mindful movement. Um, if you're afraid of movement, um, or if it prevents you from moving, getting outside of the house. So <clears throat> how do you cope right now with anxiety? And you can ask yourself, is it working for me? And there might be parts of it that are working, parts of it that are not working. But never in the history, I like this quote, of calming down, has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down? So, so um, you know, even when we tell ourselves, just calm down, just calm, it doesn't often work. And it's as, as if people expected us to will it away, to just will the anxiety away. If only we had thought about being more positive, how silly of us. 
And this is written from a guy, um, an article about how I learned to cope with chronic pain and, um, you know, his frustration, you know, if only I had thought about being more positive, you know, I, as if he had never thought about that. How silly. He's obviously, you know, making fun. So the, the anxious state is being in your head instead of in your body. And with, when you're living with pain, right, this makes sense. It makes sense why we wouldn't want to live in our body if it's because it's uncomfortable. But also being in your head, which I think where most of the world does tend to live, um, can, is, it can be a very anxious place to live. There is a saying um, that goes that, you know, the mind is a very dangerous place. Don't go in alone. I don't know if that's actually true, but um, more worry uh, often means a busier mind scanning for potential dangers, going past and future, past and future, um, like a rolling stone gathering more and more moss faster and faster. And it's really important in pain that we stop that process or we just get more and more wrapped up. Um, we often, you know, there's a lot of talk out there about change your mindset, just change your mindset and, you know, your life will change or change your thoughts, change your life. There is some value to that, that we're going to dive into, but most of the time, I want to say anxiety is actually living physiologically in your body, in your subconscious. And our minds are a very, very small part of our experience. They just seem to take up all the air time. It's very difficult, uh, although not impossible, but very difficult to think your way out of anxiety because you're using the same apparatus, your brain, that perhaps got you in there in the first place. So we end up overthinking and um, we may need to shift away completely rather than battling in our mind, shift away to something else. So right now I'm going to give you the stop practice and let's just do this together right now. By the way, this, this webinar tonight, it is being recorded and we are going to go till um, probably 730. So just, just so those of you that, that know that, just so you know that. So the stop practice is something you can do again, to shift your brain, to make new neural patterns when you notice yourself and let's do it right now. So just, Take a moment to just stop, just pause, just press pause. And again, take two or three deeper breaths. Take the time to, to do this. So S for stop, T, take two or three deeper breaths and observe. What am I telling myself right now? Am I telling myself, you know, about the future or this day is going to be a bad day? Am I telling myself my life is ruined by the pain? What am I telling myself? And just after you notice that um, and you pause, uh, the, to proceed with your day in a way that feels perhaps um, more aligned or better for you. So if you get getting really wrapped up in something and you're really feeling overwhelmed, you know, you might pause and you might stop what you're doing and do something else, or you might slow down and just proceed with what you're doing. But it's a matter of stopping becoming aware, making a choice. All right, so here's where I wanna talk about your particular individual response to anxiety. In other words, what is your anxiety fingerprint? How does it show up for you in your body? Take a moment and you, know, you, you might, can notice right now or think about something that you are worried about. You no, know, I'm just bringing something up in my own mind. Just think about something that does, 
you know, present to you um, quite large on your plate. And start to notice what happens to your breath. Did you start, did you hold your breath? Were you breath holding? Did it become short and shallow? Hmm. Notice body tension. Did you notice your shoulders going up towards your ears? Did you notice your jaw tighten? Some people feel like a, almost like a squeezing on their head. Some people notice a, a ten, tension in, in their gut. Um, all kinds of ways anxiety shows up. But notice, because often it's the same in your own body. And now notice your thoughts and what they tend to do. Do you run into the what ifs of the future or I shouldn't have of the past? And if you have your pen and paper there, you might wanna just write down for you what your anxiety fingerprint sounds like, looks like, feels like in your body. And you might be saying, well, why do I want to do, why do I want to know this? I came to this webinar tonight to, to know how to get rid of it. Yes. And that hasn't been working all, all that well, is my guess. Because until we come to know it and work with it, then we can see it for what it is, which is fear. And, you know, fear, F-E-A-R, some people say it's false evidence appearing real. Now, I want to just go to the, the uh, just one comment, you know, Steve, I, telling myself my home is safe from flooding on the Smilkening River in Princeton. Well, I just, I want to really acknowledge that, um, that that is a very real worry to have right now. And so much compassion for you. And we are all keeping our fingers crossed that, um, that your home is safe. So that's a, you know, that's a, that's a real, um, that's a real threat in your mind and in your body right now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed and just really acknowledging that, let, you know, let us know next time. So, um, start with the practical basics. I, that, that being said, even when there is a real fear, um, such as, you know, a sick child, uh, worried about your home being flooded, um, something upcoming that, that uh, doesn't feel safe, these practical basics for, will work for any, anything, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking about all those people out there tonight, including yourself, who's, who's, um, who are dealing with flooding. Yeah, and notice for those of us that aren't dealing with flooding that we don't always notice what we don't have in our lives. You know, all those things that we could have that we actually don't have. Yeah. Oops, oh, my dog's barking to that. Um, so starting with the practical basics to ask, what does your body need more of? Excuse me a moment, I'm just let her out. So don't forget these little tools. Um, don't forget these, these things that can also cause a feeling of stress and anxiety in your body. Do you need water? Dehydration will cause anxiety. Do you need nourishing food? Do you need sleep? Do you need to optimize your sleep? Are you having sleep problems? Because if you have insomnia or waking up through the night, um, you're, you're very likely going to have more anxiety. Um, do you need movement? Does your body need to move? Because bodies are not particularly meant to be just staying in the same place all day. Do you need more oxygen? Do you need to breathe more? And I would say, um, 
100% of people probably need to breathe a little bit more fuller, a little bit more expansive breaths, because when we're not breathing, when we're breathing short and shallow, or we're more like gasping, um, our body thinks that we're in danger. It, it actually believes that we're being chased or we're being uh, threatened in some way without us even having to do anything. Do we need support, companionship of the right people? So the safe people, the people that right now in your life, and it might be a dog, it might be a pet, um, the people where you feel like you can just be yourself. Do you need more laughter in your life? Do you need to, you know, do you need to watch some funny comedies? Do you need to bring that lightness into your body? And so I don't want to overlook these very simple ways that we have at our fingertips. Do we need to relax our muscles a little bit more when we're bracing against life or bracing against ourselves? That's a really common um, well, it's actually a very uh, easy intervention to make with anxiety. And again, um, pets are also uh, a nice, relaxing, um, comforting, you know, um, place to be. And gentle stretching can make a, a lot of difference. And again, if you want to start stretching and moving again, join me on Thursday mornings for to learn how to move safely again. And then ask, what does my body need less of? And these might sound really obvious, but they're not always. Do I need less caffeine? Do I need less alcohol? Uh, do I need to get off Facebook? You know, is it making me actually feel worse? Mm, do I need less or no news? It's okay to take a break from the news. I'm gonna give you all permission to do that. Um, I absolutely had to do that for a while. And now it's about once a week. You can do that. Do you need less of that person um, in your life? You know, you know that person or the people that make you stress or tense. In other words, you're more, the more toxic relationships. You have a right to, um, to have less of that person? Do I need to be less, sitting less? You know, do I need to be moving a little bit more mm, or ruminating, you know, uh, time for going over and over and over things? Do I need some more action in my life or doing? Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about thinking. Mark Twain says, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which never happened. And I think that's true um, for a lot of people, because again, our minds will get to work thinking of all the worst case scenarios. And this word catastrophizing, it's a big word. It does describe the thinking pattern is often associated with a lot of research with increased pain. So this is really worth um, tackling. The what ifs, uh, the I'll never, the ruminating, the worry, the catastrophizing, the fear. Um, so just notice for a moment, maybe you might, if you have your pen and paper, you can even write out the thoughts you have that are worrying to you. And when you've got them out there, you can look at them and see that these are, you know, simplest um, sentence ever, ever, but actually most difficult sentence ever. They are just thoughts right now in this moment. Where are they? And thoughts are like um, bolts of electricity that run through your brain and cause a response. If I had a thought here right now in front of me, it would be like a cloud. I wouldn't be able to put my hand through it. I, I mean, sorry, I would. I'd be able to put my hand right through it because they're not actually here. So that's, that's a really important, important point. 
And we can choose whether we're going to believe that in this moment or not. And a really good question to, well, I'm going to get to that later in this uh, the next couple of slides. Remember that I have, I have someone in my life, who, um, an elderly person who makes it their job to worry. You know, if I, she'll say, if I didn't, um, you know, I have to worry, it's my job. Well, if you want to make it your job, but to remember worry does not equal love or problem solving. Um, and, and sometimes we feel, I, or I've heard people say that, you know, um, it, I, it wouldn't feel right not to worry about the people that I love. So just to remember that you are not your thoughts and many of your thoughts are simply not true. Every day we get estimated 60 to 80,000 thoughts coming through our mind, different thoughts, random coming from who knows where, running through our mind. Most are repetitive. They're thoughts from yesterday or 10 years ago, and a lot are negative. So you can ask when you get stuck on one, you know, when you have a sticky thought, is this actually true? And this is the work of someone called Byron Katie. Is this, is this true? And you can ask yourself, how do I feel when I think that thought? What does it feel like in my body? And you can also imagine, you can use your imagination to ask yourself, what would it be like if, who would I be if I was not able to think that thought? If it was just not possible for my brain to think that thought, what would it feel like? How would I move? How would I move through my day? What would it feel like? Because remember that a thought is just that, a thought. What does Nicole say? Fact checking. Yes. So check, check it out. Check it out. Thoughts are not facts. And we often make the mistake of thinking that they are. And we make big assumptions um, about ourselves, about other people. Um, and um, you know, we get into assumptions, which is a thought distortion, causes a lot of anxiety. Uh, we get into thinking that we can mind read or, you know, mind reading, or oh, they must think this about me, or they must think, uh, or they don't, I'm sure they don't like me from the way that, you know, they looked at me when I saw them on the street the other day. So we can really get into, yeah, um, it's good to do that fact checking. What are the facts? What actually happened or what is actually happening right now? And when you start doing the practice of that, life can become a lot more simple. Because as far as I know, um, when we let go of all our, our um, assumptions and our fears and our projections into the future, and then our worries and regrets about the past, we are left with this moment right here, which is, it is the only moment that exists right here. It's right here, you in this class, that's it. Um, in your room, it's the only moment that we have. And right now, you know, uh, next point, notice what story you're telling yourself in this moment. That is a brain and mind process that's going on. Simple thought awareness or meditations can really help to detach from sticky thoughts. You know, the ones that just mm, won't seem to leave. And this, we won't do that tonight, um, but I'm gonna give you some resources that you can go to, to start doing that, to start unsticking the sticky thoughts. So what are your thoughts that fuel anxiety? If, if, you're, if you know already this, please feel free to write it in the chat or write it down on a piece of paper. Because I want you to start just to get those thoughts out so you can look at them and know so you recognize them when they come up. 
there's a few things that I want you to start, that it helps to start recognizing. And that is, what does it feel like in my body? And what is the thought that's fueling it? Will I be able to work? Is that a thought that we can answer right now? Probably not. You hope, hope so. Will this get worse? Right now, how does that thought make you feel? What will happen to me? I mean, it's a question, right? It's a real fear. It's a real fear. But what does it feel like to stay in that thought that has no answer right now? It has no answer. So I would relegate that to one of the not helpful thoughts. What should I do next? Well, there's a good question. And I will tell you that when you break it down from you know, the big picture, what should I do with my life to stop, breathe? What is the next best step? And what's the one after that? And the one after that, if you can start being guided that way, your life will become less um, anxious. The next best step is the next one that you're going to take. And then the next one and the next one. And when we can start becoming more mindful of this moment, this breath, and the next one, life tends to, we know this through research, life tends to get far more manageable than dealing with an anxious mind. Okay. What does your worry feel like? Okay. So that was the very first thing to notice. You write that down. What are my worrying thoughts? What does it feel like in your body? Check this out. <clears throat> Do you notice when you feel anxious, if you're feeling it right now, take a breath. What does it feel like? Heart racing, sweating, stomach discomfort, maybe a restlessness, unable to sit still. Um, perhaps you move into irritability, very easily upset. Um, sleep problems. For some people, they know absolutely when they, they're feeling anxious because they don't sleep well. Difficulty paying attention, I would say very easily distracted and perhaps easily fatigued. And there we go, the muscle pain and tension. It's uh, similar to pain. Anxiety makes it very uncomfortable to be in your body. So we want to really learn to uh, activate the other branch of our nervous system by calming through our, our breath and our muscle tension and noticing our thoughts. Mm, tingling, yes, that's a, uh, I hear that too a lot, like a tingling in hands and, um, and, and feet. Anxiety can also come from other places. It can, it can come from, um, um, from other conditions, it can also show up uh, as a result of uh, past trauma, you know, when we get triggered into um, feeling unsafe. So really to notice that. Um, yeah, burning, tingling. So it's hard to have an anxious mind in a relaxed body. One very simple little hack, I guess you could call it, is to change your posture. So often, you know, if you, wherever you are right now, go into what your anxiety posture is. So it might be like, you know, fight, it might be flight, or it might be a, a stillness, like a frozen, like a freeze. So just notice for yourself what your anxiety posture is. And then let's do this together. This is a get grounded. Feel your feet. If you can, with your breath, lengthen your spine. So you're not moving into protective or fight. So lengthen your spine, crown of your head. And if it helps to look up and around, up and around, because when we're focused on threats, 
if we're running away from a bear, we're not going to be looking up and around. So this tells us through our vagus nerve that right now we're safe because I can look out the window up at the top part of the um, of my room. Notice your shoulders. Do they feel balanced or do they feel like they're off to one side? So shoulders balance. Think about having a strong back, a soft front and an easy breath. When we start to relax through the body, it's much more difficult to have an anxious mind. There's also very specific restorative yoga poses, um, like a few that I've put here. One is just lying flat. The other one is legs up on a chair or legs up on a wall. So you're reversing the blood flow to your heart. Um, and uh, those have been shown to reduce anxiety. I really encourage you to involve the body in this. Yeah, so um, just to acknowledge that I've been to the hospital for chest pain, sweating, numbness. Um, the ER says it's your anxiety. Yes. When you're having a panic attack or, you know, um, a feeling panicky or anxious, it actually can mimic a heart attack. So I often see people after they've gone to uh, the ER, ER a few times, really believing, really frightening that they're having a heart attack. Um, and then they get all checked out and it's, um, uh, they say just your anxiety. And I put quotations around just because anxiety is, is um, it can and really affect your life as well, right? So really even more important to practice uh, deep breathing, body relaxation. All right. Moving into the finish line here, ways to calm that flipping lid. Notice, okay, after you've breathed, you've relaxed your muscle tension, you've noticed what's happening in your body. Notice this particular problem is not here right now. It is a thought. Now that doesn't mean that your pain's not here right now. <clears throat> We're talking about the thoughts that we put on top of it. We can come right into, as we just did, present moment awareness of this moment right here. Where does your mind want to jump to the future or move to the past? And can you allow yourself to open up right now, maybe uh, perhaps through all of your senses, your sight, your smell, touch to be here right now. And one of the, um, two mindfulness practices that can really help. One is um, when you're eating. And again, this is all brain training, brain training that will have lasting effects. Mindful eating is when you sit down to a meal and you just slow it down by using all your senses throughout that meal. I won't go into that right now because that's a practice in itself. Um, but it is brain training for the present moment. Okay. Uh, another one is um, washing dishes. Can you be there with the temperature of the water, the feeling, the um, smell, the sensations in that moment when your mind might be wandering to past and future? Again, brain training for the moment. Um, another very more simple one is gratitude for what is here. So right now I can think of all the things that I wish were better, that aren't what they want. I want them to be, that I'm not happy with. I can also notice that I'm here. I've got a glass of water. I get to talk. Um, I've got a computer. I'm warm. I've got light, I've got electricity, I've got some food. I do have a bed I can sleep in tonight. And all of those things that are already good in your life. And once you start um, noticing those things, you can really find more and more and more and more and more. And this is not ignoring the fact that there are worries and that there's things going on in your life that you're worried about. 
It's not ignoring the pain, but it's spreading out your attention, widening the scope to include the things that you might have overlooked. Okay. So ruminating sometimes actually protects us from what we're really feeling. So when we're just really anxious about something, it can be like a bubbling lid on the top of grief, of sadness um, um, that you might be protecting or bracing against. I don't know how many people I have taught breathing to, and when they start to expand their lungs and welcome more oxygen into their body, they just completely break down in tears, unresolved grief from the past that needs to be held and felt and expressed, but it's being held tightly in a world that doesn't um, encourage or want to see a natural expression of grief, of tears. Once you're in tears, you're in recovery, I tell people, that you're already healing. Every tear you shed is healing. So notice, is there something that you're protecting, you're bracing yourself from underneath? And you might talk about that with someone. It's really more common than we think. Mm -hmm. Do what needs to be done, then rest. So there were some examples I was going to run through, but uh, we're kind of, kind of coming close to time here. Um, so, you know, uh, Mary, and these are not their real names, he was saying, I can't get rid of this tight feeling in my gut. You know, it's this tight feeling. And I was just doing everything to try to get rid of it. When we explored what was actually in that tight feeling, there was a lot of grief and a lot of emotion that came out that released that tight feeling and had a natural impact on her pain condition. And that actually had a huge, I remember her well, huge impact on her pain condition um, when those emotions were released. Um, another uh, uh, person, uh, we'll call him John. My work is so stressful, I'm not sure I can keep doing it. Um, and in this uh, situation, um, he really needed to step up. He was anxious about asking for what he needed from his boss. And, um, and when he was able to at least express and ask for what he needed, um, I can't recall at the moment whether his needs were responded to, but he was actually able to, um, yes, that's right, have a modified work um, experience that was helpful for him. So he was really, really anxious about that conversation. <clears throat> and then Betty says, my pain is so bad right now. What if it never gets better? So again, what if, it, what if going to that worst case scenario? And the answer for her, I, I remember this well, was establishing safety, doing those safety breaks in the moment and bringing in self-compassion to herself that she was worried about her health and, and her life. And not but, but and right now she was safe, right now she was okay. And that helped her, no matter what the future brought for her, to be in her life and to actually experience her life in the moment, because anxiety robs us of our life in the moment, doesn't it? Okay, I want to give you this um, self encouragement. Okay. Got two more slides after this, so we're pretty good. <clears throat> Box breathing. Um, let's just do this for a couple of minutes because this can be helpful and you can keep on going with this after the webinar ends if you want to. Um, but box breathing can be really helpful for anxiety and for pain. So find a comfortable position and we're gonna breathe in for a count of four, hold it for four, out for four and hold for four. So let's just, uh, let's try this. Find your feet on the floor and we're gonna start by just um, all doing a big exhale. So breathe out completely. And then we're gonna breathe in, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, four.
four and hold two, three, four. Breathe in two, three, four. Hold two, three, four. Breathe out two, three, four, and hold. Let's do this one more time. Biggest breath you've had all day, all the way in. Even more, filling up, hold in all that oxygen so it gets to circulate and saturate and then let it go. Let it go. Relax any body tension. And just return to the natural, normal rhythm of your breath. Okay. It can sometimes be useful if you're in the waiting room. You can follow the, the course of the, you know, at the clinic of the door or the window, wherever you are, you can usually find a box to focus on, a square, because then it gives your mind something to do at the same time. All right, so self-management, find your own doorway, find what seems easiest for you, going starting with your breath or body, or your mind, what story you're telling yourself to start getting unstuck. And I wanna um, just circle back to a question right now about the freeze response, which is a great question. And I, I feel like we should unpack that in a webinar um, uh, just for that. Um, because freeze, you're right, it is harder to combat by its very nature, but there are ways. Um, so very simply, breathe, uh, sorry, freeze is when you can't fight it, you can't flight it, you can't get away from it, and your body goes into a shutdown, a numbing, a disconnection, almost a dissociation. When you can start to notice that, then you can't speak, you often can't think clearly, you do want to pause, um, I'll just <clears throat> really super quickly, and you might start bringing just some movement to your body. So it might be some very subtle movement of your fingers, maybe a movement um, back and forth. Maybe it's your breath that to remind yourself coming out of freeze that you're still here and you're still alive. Because freeze can often feel like, you know, such an, an immobilization. So I'm going to leave it at that right now for freeze, but it's definitely something that um, we should talk some more about because right now there's a lot of people um, in the world um, coming out of a freeze, coming out of decades or a lifetime of freeze. And when the freeze starts to thaw, it, um, it comes out the same way that it went in. So it's often, often there's anxiety and fear and anger as the freeze starts to thaw. But that is a web, that is a webinar in itself. Thanks for the, the suggestion. Most of the people I work with are in a freeze response coming out, thawing, coming out. Um, so find your doorway, ask yourself what you need in this moment. What is it that fits for you right now? Try different things. Um, uh, try different things at different times and see what works for you. Um, and you know, different things are gonna work at different times. Know that if you need rest, or you decide to let a problem go, you are still, that is still healing. Sometimes um, people feel, well, I'm not doing anything. Oh, you're doing a lot. When you choose, if you dare to rest, dare to have a nap, uh, and if you're a person that doesn't normally, you're doing a lot. If you decide that's not something that I can or want to deal with right now, and it's not something I have to deal with, um, you don't have, if it's an option, you don't have to. And, and sometimes that is the choice, right? And I want to say too, for the sensitive people out there, you can ask yourself, is this mine to heal or somebody else's? It's just a very simple question. Are you taking on somebody else's anxiety? Because you cannot heal what is not yours. I think that's another webinar in itself, isn't it? Um, <laughs> okay, 
Very last slide, guided practices. If you wanna take this any further and you really feel like you want some training, some regular practice, I caution you to find a voice, a length and a type that you like. And don't stop until you find one because there's many different options um, for guided practices. Uh, the Insight Timer app is um, really great. It's, it's worth it. I, I mean, it's free. It's worth checking out. Um, the Calm app. Uh, do join our Empowered Relief program uh, once a month, and then you'll get an audio meditation with that that's, that's um, quite powerful for pain and anxiety. Um, Do, uh, John Kabat-Zinn is a mindfulness teacher that I really enjoy. And also I mentioned to the class this morning, there's a program called a program. Yeah, it is a program called Breathworks out of the UK um, that teaches mindfulness for pain management. Okay, so I hope that, um, I hope there's been something. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Judy. Yeah, Headspace is, is good too. I haven't looked at it for a, a long, long time. Um, I hope there's something in this webinar tonight that you picked up that you're going to, it might be, it doesn't have to be anything big. In fact, the smaller sometimes the better that you can move into um, uh, using tonight to start managing the anxiety that comes as a result of pain on top of the pain, but also tends to amplify or make pain worse. Ah, take a breath. Know that you're not alone. And um, there's nothing wrong with you if you're feeling anxious. It, but there is something um, that you can do about it. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks for coming, everyone. And uh, reach out if you have any questions. And um, next Monday, we are talking again. We're going back and not going back. We're moving forward and talking about anger and pain, part two. So if you're joining us next week, you might take a moment to watch the first part on, on anger. Um, and we're going to continue that discussion for next week. So take care and um, have a good, peaceful, relaxing and quiet night. Bye for now.